Um, interested in for about 10 years or so, but about six months ago I said, okay, I should really sit down and try and figure out how all this works. Um, and the timing is quite fortuitous in that I didn't realise it was going to be the uh, contemporaneous investigations by the UK House of Commons and the Permanent Subcommittee in the US. Um, and on the principle that you only really understand something when you can explain it to others, I offered to give the talk here today. And I'm grateful to the Institute for facilitating this. Uh, now, um, this is my iconic image of Irish industrialization. It's from the mid 1950s. Um, the origin of our low corporation tax regime, of course, was export profits tax relief, which was introduced in 1956, which gave a very generous tax break to profits derived from increased manufacturing exports out of Ireland. There's a number of ironies that surface here. One that the Americans were amused by when I was interviewed recently on National Public Radio, that export profits tax relief was originally envisaged here as a stimulus to indigenous exporters. But the IDA, which was formed in 1949, used some of its martial aid funding to hire a New York consultancy, bizarrely called IBEC, to, uh, to do this work. And their report in 1952 drew Ireland's attention to the case of Puerto Rico, which had instituted something similar to export profits tax relief. So that's when two and two came together in the Irish psyche. Um, Another irony is that when we did introduce export profits tax relief in 1956, it looks to me on paper as though it was definitely in breach of an agreement that we had signed with the precursor of the OECD a mere one year previously, which banned artificial aids to exporters. But the OEEC actually took quite a benign view of the new Irish policy because they saw it as Ireland moving from protectionism towards outward orientation. So they were actually quite laudatory in their response. This one is probably the most significant irony, is that back in 2000, um, the US introduced a new policy that the EU criticised because it said the use of tax havens in the Caribbean gave US firms a competitive advantage. And really this point is going to surface again and again, that there's a paralysis in US tax policy between the Democrats, who basically want to try and raise increased tax revenues, and the Republicans who are concerned with the competitive advantage of US multinationals. I mentioned the OECD. There, when the OECD instituted its harmful tax competition uh, program back in 1998, there was initially four criteria by which a tax haven was defined. The first one is that a tax haven would have low or zero corporation tax. But the OECD recognised that that on its own is not a sufficient criterion to, for a jurisdiction to be deemed a tax haven. Because countries with different characteristics have diff optimally different rates of corporation tax. So a country like Ireland that is a small market, that's a peripheral country, that's a late industrializer, for countries like that you optimally have a lower rate of corporation tax than jurisdictions like the UK, Germany, France. I mentioned France there because if any of you you know, recall the World Bank report of a year or two ago that said France has a very low effective rate of corporation tax. That is just not true. That's a lazy piece of work by the World Bank. They did that over the course of a few months or so. Some academics have spent their lifetimes working out effective corporation tax rates. I have a note to myself there, skip that, so I don't want to spend much time on it. France's effective corporation tax rate is very high. Um, the second OECD criterion is a lack of transparency. Transparency, uh, uh, lack of transparency, meaning that different multinationals can get different special tax deals. The name Jim Hines, he's the leading US academic on corporation tax, tax havens, and so on. His name is going to surface again on the next slide, so I want to introduce him to you here because he is the main US academic 
that, ha that identified or called Ireland a tax haven. And I asked him why he did that, and he said, well, you offer tax holidays to multinationals. And I said, that's news to me. On further discussion, it turned out that he was misinterpreting what are called grandfathering clauses in Irish legislation with the notion of tax holidays. Grandfathering occurred twice in Irish corporation tax policy. One in the late 1970s, when we moved from export profits tax relief to a 10% rate on manufacturing activities. Companies that had come in here before that move were offered grandfathering clauses. That, trend, that change would, was eased in over a 10-year period. The other main change was in the late 1990s, when we moved from 10% on manufacturing to 12.5% across the entire economy. And again, companies that were here already, that, those, that transition was grandfathered in through the use of these clauses. So when I heard Apple you know, talking to the US Senate and saying we got a special tax deal, that was my initial interpretation of what was going on. That the Apple executives who were speaking to the US Senate were not there in place, of course, in 1979 or 1980 when Apple came in. The IDA has a different interpretation, which is very, very interesting if I have if I've time to, to mention it later on. So how did Ireland, some of you might recall in 2009, the, the White House uh, under Obama um, recently elected, issued a press statement that referred to Ireland and the Netherlands as tax havens. And that was taken down overnight because I certainly know our Department of Finance here and presumably in the Netherlands got in touch immediately. That comes directly from Jim Hines. So I'd mentioned already Jim Hines's misinterpretation of Irish law. Hines and Rice, the leading economic journal, American Economic Review, included Ireland as a tax haven. The US Government Accountability Office added this Jim Hines list to a list of their own, and that Government Accountability Office report was then mentioned in the White House report. Now, this happens an awful lot with blacklists that they get self-referential, sometimes leading to hilarious results like you see here. Venezuela copied the Mexican blacklist word for word. And because Mexico had blacklisted Venezuela, Venezuela blacklisted itself. Um, so that sort of thing goes on, goes on quite a lot. The third OECD criterion is secrecy laws. Um, again, this is interesting because I have another irony here that the leading Marxist journal Time magazine called uh, the US itself one of the world's tax havens because the US is very secretive. If, you, you know, if you're an overseas person with deposits in the US, you don't get charged tax in the US and they typically won't reveal your details to other jurisdictions. This is... Tax Justice Network is an, an, an NGO that often has Ireland in its sights. It targets Ireland. This is a secrecy score, jurisdictions ranked by secrecy score. Ireland does very well in that, coming out very close to the bottom. In other words, less secretive than the UK, than the US. Whereas the main secrecy ones, this is in three columns here, so this is Ireland down here. These are the main kind of uh, tax havens, the Caymans, Bermuda, and so on. They're very secretive. Ireland does very well on the secrecy score. And the final criterion that the OECD used to define tax havens was no substantial activities. Well, surprise, surprise, this one was vetoed by the US government. They said, we're not, we're not adopting that criterion. They said that criterion can't really be measured, even though the European Court of Justice, in some of its rulings, has used exactly that criterion. So the US does not want to black, blacklist Caribbean tax havens for the reasons that I've talked about uh, earlier on. Um, so the US has been paralysed on corporation tax since the Kennedy administration, over 50 years ago. I'll return to this point now, but I want to talk just very briefly on the morality of this issue. And I'm going to use two quotes from Adam Smith. This is Adam Smith's most famous quote, which talks about how capitalism works, the invisible hand. Translated into modern economics, we say, we teach all our students, the function of a company, what its objective function is to maximize after-tax profits. Stay within the law, maximize after-tax profits. That's what companies are supposed to do in economics, 
In Harvard Business School, I know this is what its students are told, you know, your sole function, your fiduciary duty to your shareholders, maximise after-tax profits. So the multinationals say, what we're doing is entirely legal, end of story. The other interesting quote, though, from Adam Smith is this one. People of the same trade seldom meet together, even for merriment and diversion, but the conversation ends in a conspiracy against the public or in some contrivance to raise prices. In discussing the morality of aggressive tax planning, a friend of mine said, the fact that the multinationals say everything we do is strictly illegal. He said, that reminds me of the old joke, the boy who's found guilty of murdering both of his parents and then pleads for clemency on the grounds that he's an orphan. So I think that's kind of amusing. Um, so who writes the laws? Well, clearly, you know, the multinationals put lots of money into corporate lobbying. The amazing thing about the US is you can get all this data. You can tell how much each company spends on corporate lobbying. The computer and internet sector now, in 2012, spent 133 million corporate lobbying, more than the defense sector. That's kind of an astounding statistic, you know? So you you make your own decisions on the, moral, on the morality of this. The companies are obeying the law, but then you, you ask, or radicals will ask, well, who writes the law? So that's as much as I'm going to say on that matter. Let me return to um, then the history of US tax policy. Deferral is the main word that always crops up here. Before the Kennedy administration, if a US corporation made money abroad, it paid no US taxes on that as long as the money was kept offshore. That is, it deferred payment of US taxes. If it brought the money back onshore to the US, it was liable for US taxes. So that was the law in the US up till the Kennedy administration. Remember, US companies only really started to go multinational after the Second World War. So you had Eisenhower in power, then the Democrats came in with Kennedy, and Kennedy tried to change this. There is a particular principle of corporation tax that that, that view of the world adheres to. Um, but the Kennedy administration and Democrats in general have a different view of the a different view of corporation tax philosophy. That, um, that's, that's stated at the top slide here. They say overseas income of US corporations should be taxed exactly the same as income earned in the US. In other words, there should be no deferral offered. And you'll recall that when President Obama, when Obama was first running for the Democratic nomination, he made some noises about getting rid of the deferral clause. And some Irish journalists hyped this up as though it was going to be catastrophic for us, not realizing that this debate has been going on for at least 50 years in the US. The, Repo the House Republicans would not agree to any changes on deferral because they said this will disadvantage our multinational corporations in competing against competitors from uh, lower tax jurisdictions abroad. So there was a compromise reached. The 1962 compromise, I don't know if subpart F means anything to most of you here, but it's something that has been uh, I was first introduced to the term by the IDA maybe about 10 years ago, and since then, you know, it crops up in everything you read about US tax law. Subpart F says, okay, deferral remains in place. You're, if, you earn, if you're a US multinational and you earn profits abroad, you owe US tax liabilities on them, but those tax liabilities are only triggered when the profits are repatriated to the US. That is not supposed to apply to passive income royalties and so on. So think intellectual property. And intellectual property is really where all the action in these jurisdictional battles, all the action in the corporation tax debate now is about uh, royalties on intellectual property. So what has changed since the 1962 compromise? Only one thing, but I'll return, I'll return to that in a short while. I want to say Okay, have I missed a slide there? Yeah, no. Uh, the US has been gridlocked on deferral every, ever since. So here's an Irish Times headline from 1975 when Justin Keating was our Minister for Industry and Commerce where he was worried that the US uh, House of Reps was discussing changing the rules on deferral back that long ago. 
And so, you know, if you read the Irish Times again when Obama was running for president, you would have seen these, you know, people worrying, oh, he's talking about changing laws on deferral. You can go back all the way to Kennedy administration and see that the US has been debating changing laws on deferral since then. So there's nothing really new in that. And you might recall or you might know that the OECD issued its long-awaited report on changing international corporation tax law just last Friday, barely made headlines here, even though everybody was worrying, was, were the G7 going to you know, do something in Fermanagh? Instead, they kicked it to the OECD. The OECD report is really a damp squib. There's nothing going to happen because the US is not going to agree to any changes that are going to target the Caribbean tax havens. Um, so, as I say, this has been going on for forever, really. Um, I just want to have a couple of slides here on how the US tax credit system works. So, you're liable for US taxes on your overseas profits. You only pay those taxes when they're repatriated to the US. Clearly, though, if you've paid taxes overseas on your overseas profits, you get a US tax credit. That's what all these double taxation agreements are about. That means that for US corporations booking their profits in Ireland, they owe more US taxes than if they booked their profits in Germany. So the US tax authorities benefit from low tax jurisdictions around the world because tax US tax liabilities on profits in Ireland are higher than they would be on profits booked in Germany. There's, there's a lot of kind of maybe counterintuitive uh, results that come out of this study. That's one that people, a lot of people might not realize. So it's better for U the US, the IRS, the Internal Revenue Service in the US, if US multinationals book their profits in the Caribbean or in Ireland than if they booked their profits in Germany. Well, so does Germany lose out? Again, this is another rather counterintuitive uh, result that if a US multinational books its profits here and repats repatriates them to the US, it, owns, it owes the difference between the 12.5% rate here and the maybe 35% rate in the US. So it owes substantial tax liabilities to the US. Now, but those tax liabilities to the US can be reduced if, if it has paid, if this same corporation has paid excessive taxes elsewhere, say in Germany or Japan. So it can reduce the tax liabilities associated with its Irish or its Caribbean operations. What does that do? That means that actually reduces the disincentive that these corporations face in investing in high tax locations like Germany or Japan. So multinationals, not just multinationals benefit, high tax locations benefit by the existence of other low corporation tax jurisdictions. So this is, this is quite complicated, but the main key line here is that it allows high tax countries to continue to be able to attract significant levels of foreign investment. So that has led some corporation tax economists to think of high tax jurisdictions and low tax jurisdictions as complementing each other rather than as substituting for each other. And one further point about deferral before I get on to the, uh, the, 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 the stuff about intellectual property, which is really the last theme of my talk here, that deferral, so you, you, you hold your profits offshore, so that is like getting an interest-free loan from the US government on your residual US tax liabilities. So you, you only pay the US taxes when the profits are repatriated. So if you keep them offshore, that's like the US giving you, a tax, giving you as a company a tax-free loan. That reduces the costs of financing overseas investments by multinationals. And a huge proportion of reinvested earnings around, well, in Europe I have the data for, that, that these are used to finance further US investments in Europe. So if the US were to change radically its laws on deferral, 
you would definitely see less US investments overseas. You would still see some, because it makes good commercial sense, but it would remove this, uh, this subsidy, really, to overseas investments. And you can be quite sure the US State Department views US investments overseas as a form of soft power or soft US uh, policy. And the, so the State Department would not like to see the major change on deferral that Democrats sometimes talk about, but that, as I say, they've been talking about for 50 years and is, ne is never going to happen because of, because you really need bipartisan support in the US to change this stuff. Okay, hybrid entities. The hybrid entity basically is the, the, the kind of corporation tax structure, that, or sorry, the multinational structure that we here talked about with respect to the double Irish. So the double Irish is a tax loophole, not a tax loophole in Irish law, but a loophole that arises because no two jurisdictions' laws, with company law or tax law, are the same. Right? We write our tax laws, the US write their tax laws, clearly we have different tax laws in place. So any time you have two different jurisdictions writing their own tax laws, there are going to be loopholes that arise in the gap between the two. That's where these hybrid entities emerge. So why have these hybrid entities, and this is again the double Irish that's frequently talked about now and was talked about by the Senate subcommittee and so on. Um, that really only started when the IRS, the US Tax Authority, introduced new regulations in 1997 called check the box regulations. I'll need to explain that a little bit now, but that paved the way for the creative tax avoidance options that every US multinational since then has begun to explore. From a, a legal article in the US, uh, this towards the application of subpart F. So subpart F again said, you can defer payment of US taxes, but this doesn't work in the case of intellectual property because it's too easy to shift US intellectual property offshore. So to prevent that tax avoidance, subpart F said, royalty payments on intellectual property can't be deferred. The, 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 the tax, US tax is triggered when those royalty payments are earned. Check the box wipes out the meaning of subpart F. Now, Senator Levin is the chairman of the Senate subcommittee that was in the news last month for calling Ireland a tax haven and so on. This is a screen grab because I want to show this is exactly, this is from a memo that he personally wrote. Well, presumably one of his aides wrote it, but he signed it. Check the box tax regulations issued by Treasury in 1997 have reduced the effectiveness of the anti-deferral rules of subpart F, have further facilitated the increase in offshore profit shifting, which has gained significant momentum over the last 15 years. So he is recognizing that it was internal revenue service rules themselves that allowed these loopholes to be exploited by US multinationals. He mentions beside check the box, he says, the look-through rule. These are really the same thing. The Internal Revenue Service, once it realized the loopholes that it had opened up by the check-the-box regulations, it tried to roll back on them. Corporate lobbying prevented it. Instead, it got written into law as the look-through rule. So amongst the two senators who voted in favor of the look-through rule were Senator Levin and Senator McCain. You know, even though Levin himself there on the previous screen admitted that this opens the door for these creative tax avoidance uh, uh, procedures by US multinationals. So the, the hypocrisy either makes you laugh or cry, whichever. Um, so how this worked then, check the box rules, the IRS was inundated with tax statements every year. So to cut down the work, they introduced these rules that said, say you have two foreign entities, they're in the same country, 
same firm, but they're just different entities. We ignore the difference between them. We'll allow them to submit one tax return to us, the IRS, the American Tax Authorities. So this is where the double Irish came in. So for example, a US corporation sets up a holding company in Ireland, and this holding company owns the corporation's operating company in Ireland. Check the box says they only need to submit one tax return to the US. They're regarded in the US as the same company. Now, of course, yeah, the holding company in, in Ireland owns the intellectual property. So that should be subpart F income. That should be the US tax liability should be triggered immediately on that. But because they're allowed, regarded as the same company as the operating company in Ireland, then subpart F is not triggered. That money can be earned and kept offshore and treated as though earned by the holding company. Now, this is the interesting bit. The holding company and the operating company are both incorporated in Ireland, so US tax law defines them as Irish. Irish tax law is different. As I say, every country's tax law is different. The US don't write our tax laws for us. We have a different set of tax laws and company laws derived from our own history. So Irish law is different. The two companies we define as American because that's where ownership and control resides. They're both subsidiaries of an American corporation. By our law, the operating company is tax resident here because it has substantive operations here. The holding company has no substantive operations here, and so it's not Irish. We don't regard it as Irish. So that's what our tax law says. So this is the gap between US tax laws and our tax laws. So to US tax laws, these two companies are incorporated in Ireland, therefore they're Irish. Our rules are different. The company doing substantive activities is tax resident in Ireland because that's what our tax rules insist on. The company that has no real presence in Ireland, the holding company, is not there for tax resident in Ireland. It doesn't have real operations in Ireland. It, might be ta it can be tax resident elsewhere, typically Bermuda or the Caribbean. Now, just I'm, I'm almost done now, so I'm making reasonably good time, I think. Um, so where do our tax laws come from now? So the US tax laws say, OK, companies are incorporated in Ireland, therefore they're Irish. Our tax laws derive from Britain's. This is a, just a little bit of British history here. Virtual residency derives, there was a long series of court cases up through the Victorian era and so on, culminating in 1929, a case held that went, I think, to the Privy Council or whatever you call it in the UK, that found that a company registered in London but without any UK activities was not subject to British taxation. Those sorts of precedents are recognised in Irish law, so that laid down the rule for jurisdictions whose legal framework derived from the UK. So our tax laws derive from the UK. That's where our tax laws come from. That's what the companies are exploiting, the difference between non-US tax law and US tax law. So the big question then, I suppose, is did we actually change our tax laws to take advantage of check the box rules in the US? And the answer, we didn't relax our rules, we actually strengthened them, we hardened them, or we firmed them up. The Finance Act 1999 tightened our rules. Now it didn't go the American route, we didn't say, you know, um, uh, that simply because a company is incorporated in Ireland, it's tax resident here, but we went far enough in that direction. We said that companies that are able to use this hybrid form, they need to have a direct relationship with, to a company with substantive activities in Ireland. Otherwise, we're not going to recognise them. At, we're, we're go otherwise, we're going we're to tax them in Ireland. So we strengthened our rules, but you can see that you know, the companies and their corporate lawyers are on the eye, uh, uh, have their eyes out all the time for gaps between different tax rules that, operate, that are instituted in different jurisdictions, and they make use of this. 
These hybrid companies, these are not just an Irish phenomenon. These, I, I was reading recently the tax treaty between the US and Canada. That has clauses about hybrid companies and so on. Our tax treaties with the US, our tax treaty with the US is negotiated every so often. If the US wanted to close this down, they could do so. You know, we need our tax treaty with the US. The US can close these things down overnight if they want to. The fact that they don't close them down means that there are very powerful interests in the US who do not want them closed down. Those interests politically are reflected in the Republican Party. Economically, they're the multinationals. So the multinationals clearly don't want the tax rules changed. OK, my final slide then. So I've talked about the double Irish there, as it's called. You know, So you set up two companies in Ireland, one both incorporated in Ireland, one with substantive activities that's tax resident in Ireland, the other one without substantive activities that is not there for tax resident in Ireland, it's tax resident in the Caribbean. That's where the hybrid, hybridicity comes from. So my final slide here then is that if you've heard about the double Irish, you've probably also heard about the Dutch sandwich. So I just want to explain to you. And there's not just one Dutch sandwich. There are thousands, if not millions, of Dutch sandwiches. This is one, anyway, that was, uh, that was applied in Ireland. So Ireland, we don't have tax treaties with the Caribbean tax havens. So typically, if royalty payments on intellectual property located in the Caribbean were being paid out of Ireland, withholding taxes would have been kept on those royalty payments that were going to the Caribbean. The Netherlands has a much more liberal royalty pay, uh, withholding tax regime. It doesn't imp impose withholding taxes on payments to the Caribbean. So what the multinationals would do, they would set up a Dutch company at the intersection between the Caribbean holding company and the Irish operating company. So we have a tax treaty with the Netherlands, so we don't impose withholding taxes on the royalty payments that go to the Dutch company. Holland doesn't impose withholding taxes on those royalty payments when they then go to the Caribbean. So it's a circuitous route to get the money from Ireland to the Caribbean, bypassing it through the Netherlands in order to avoid tax. This is what multinational companies do. This is why their tax lawyers, I guarantee you, earn more than anybody in this room. And that's what it's all about. So I'm done. Thank you.